7 o'clock. Um, this meeting of the Reading Municipal Light Department Board of Commissioners is um, hereby called to order and is being videotaped at the RMLD's office at 230 Ash Street. And uh, given the current pandemic crisis, we are, as, as are other boards in town, notably the Select Board, uh, two members are participating remotely, uh, that being John Stefik and Dave Hennessy. And and the three of us are here and maintaining the appropriate separation. Uh, Phil Vecino on my left, and I'd like to welcome Bob Coulter, who is our newly elected commissioner. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. Welcome to the board. Um, and Colleen is here, and there is nobody else here because the doors are locked, and the public, if they would wish to comment, will do so remotely uh, according to the instructions on the website. We also have Mark Doxer here the newly appointed chair of the select board who is participating remotely. You can't see him out in TV land, but he's participating remotely as are John and David on a, um, a Microsoft Teams link. So with that being established, uh, um, Phil, are you open to being the board secretary tonight? Yes, yes, yes I am. Every month now. Yes, I am. Um, we have a public comment now, but there is no public here. The one member of the potential public would be Mark. Would you like to say anything, Mark? Hello, everybody. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hello, back. Exactly. Yeah, then you're referring to
to the town payment, and of course that was always the plan, and that those discussions will continue and will not be concluded tonight, um, but I'm glad we're moving things along, and thank you for that, Mark. Um, and I don't think we have any, um, well, the, the cab is not here tonight, the Citizens Advisory Board, the liaison, I guess, Mark, maybe you're the liaison, but it, if you have anything to add to that, um, as the select board liaison uh, and public comment, so that kind of takes care of item four. Um, again, I'd like to re welcome uh, Robert Coulter, who goes by Bob, uh, to the board mm -hmm. and introduce him to everybody. Thank you, Bob, for, for stepping up and uh, for joining us. And if you'd like to just say a few words about you know, who you are and your background, and um, we'd love to hear a little bit. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I uh, grew up in Reading. Uh, I'm, I was here until I was about 21, then I left for approximately 25 years, came back. Um, about four, a little over four years ago now, came back to town. It's a, that's a lot different from when I left. You know, a lot more reminds me a little bit more like Uber now. You know, it's a little bit more um, built out. There's yep. more restaurants and retail. But um, came back and decided it was during the town meeting and it was this a time to contribute more in, into the community. And uh, my mom worked here for 25 years and she loved this place and she she really did. So. Um, Look like so, something I do, and I'm, I'm in the this business. Uh, understand it very well, from from the ground up, from underground up. Yep. You know, so I thought I was a, a a good fit for 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 this team. Yep. Maybe bring some uh, knowledge from that industry side. I know there's other folks on the board that have great great skill sets, but maybe I can contribute from that manner. Most certainly, and uh, I understand you work for National Grid, and you're you're telling us earlier yes. your, what's your role at National Grid. Um, in National Grid, I'm a design supervisor right now, so I oversee uh, the North Shore. Um, I oversee uh, roadway jobs, uh, underground construction, overhead construction, um, new building, commercial construction, residential. Yep. Unit construction uh, subdivisions. So, again, have a very good understanding. Do a lot of third-party attachments, a lot of solar, yep. any type of uh, you know um, green generation. We get engaged with. So, uh, understand the from the engineering aspect, from the customer interaction, to economic impact, and down to you know construction scheduling. So that's wonderful, and uh, really happy to have you joining the board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Um, and then, so now we wanted to move on to, um, did you want to wait on the next item, or are we good? No, no, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I want, oh, yes. to, I want so, to move sorry. that we take item 7B out of order. Yep. Please. Yeah, good point. Uh, Phil rightly notes that we want to discuss the current pandemic and RMLD's response, and thanks for that, Phil. So, Coley, do you want to jump and just talk a little bit about sure. that? Do need to vote on that? Do you take uh, it out of order? I mean, I don't think so, but okay. maybe we Fine. can. Yeah. Um, Come arrest us. Yep. Yeah. So first, I just want to say that this is uh, an electric utility, and we are committed to the obligation of providing safe and reliable power to the town. We are here to respond for emergencies, um, and and everyone should feel confident with that. Um, this is how we've been addressing uh, this uh, pandemic uh, thus far. So immediately we established an emergency response team made up of all of the directors, there's seven of, us, seven of us, one from each of the divisions. We established an emergency infectious disease plan which discusses, um, and it's a, they're called uh, emergency operating procedures, EOPs, HR for who's responsible for it, and then it's given a number of the year that it's established. So we, all of our procedures are very um, detailed. Uh, social distancing with all electrical operations assigned to individual trucks and cell phones. Uh, facilities, we have proper signage up. Uh, the building is closed per the uh, public health. Uh, building HVAC filter upgrades and cleaning product upgrades spe specific to this particular virus. Uh, training, uh, except for webinars, um, travel, uh, things like that are suspended. Uh, meetings moving from less than 10 to conference calls using Zoom, Microsoft Teams. Uh, I became a member, uh, I went from the emergency operating uh, planning, uh, operating team command to a member of the town of Reading emergency planning team, which comes under command now. We respond to their, their command goals. Uh, we've met, uh, we met this week, we, we're probably going to meet again tomorrow. The purpose of that is to make sure that we are planning with uniformity and consistency with the town. 
So while we service four towns, uh, we're, we're following the town of Reading for, for uh, health instructions of that nature. Um, press releases on redirecting focus away from projects uh, and planned outages onto resiliency, troubleshooting, um, service connections, and non-outage maintenance work. So just a, sh a bit of a, sh a shift of focus. Uh, we developed an emergency plan of option uh, operations, and what we do with that is we identify critical businesses, that's IT, electric functions, we prioritize them, and then we evaluate the ability to perform from home. Uh, we establish minimum staffing and cross-training capabilities. Uh, we are establishing, or we establish remote working procedures, and I'll get into that for a second, team A and team B. Team A is remote, team B is in the office. For, for redundancy of uh, essential personnel, until March 27th, and then we'll do a reassessment. We've established minimum stocking for one month supply, and that's across the board, electric, IT, everything. Um, notified overhead and underground on-site contractors of continued work and notification of any crew member swap. We don't, be, because you need a, a minimum amount of qualified, knowledgeable people of this particular system and our on-site contractors, we have both overhead and underground, we want to maintain them and we want to maintain those people and we want to know if they need to swap out anybody. Uh, and then uh, we developed a major emergency plan of op operations, which is a MEPO, and that kind of takes something like a COVID-19 and adds like another layer of disaster on top of that. So now you're less than minimum staffing, uh, you're, re you're redefining your basic functions, um, line operations, substation operations, stockmen, engineering control authorities, overhead underground, contractors, crews, and supervisors have to be here. Shift rotation would change than just the regular hours of team A and team B, and then we would probably call on mutual aid, which is the other 41 municipals or anything outside of New England that could help us respond. Now, um, with this, so for example, with the line operations, the, the town of Reading was um, very kind this morning at about 6.30 when I called Joe Huggins, because we were going to put Team B in one of the substations, but it, I, I don't want that contaminated because that's a place that we have to respond to, so the town was kind enough to give us a remote location building that we can, that we can use for about six people uh, from line operations and substation technicians, and so they'll be separated. Um, and, and again, we're, we're still continuing our business, uh, business continuity, everything's flowing, even though some people are being able to work remote. Um, so we're in pretty good shape uh, from that respect so far. Great. So that's what we're doing. Um, okay. Did I leave out anything? Mr. Chairman? Phil. Yeah, I, you know, I'm glad to hear that we're protecting our employees. But I also want to talk about the human cost that's going on here. I live near the railroad station here in Reading and I can actually look into one of the parking lots. I am amazed that in these days, usually the only time that parking lot is empty is on the weekends. That parking lot is empty during the week. It's amazing. So I think people are not working. I'm very concerned about, you know, what uses there may be at this point. I also, you know, emailed, you know, earlier today that, you know, I want to, you know, what we're doing for people who can't afford to pay their bills because I think there's a real human cost that's going on here, and I think, you know, we may see less usage if businesses shut down. I heard just today on the radio coming here that TJ Maxx is going to close wow. for two weeks. So I'm concerned about what usage we've got and what, what, the, what the, the effect may be going so forward here, be. and also what we're going to do for people who cannot pay, pay their bills have at this already, point. Have you already seen a load drop? Uh, not, not, not so far. Okay. Uh, but we're usually a month and a half behind with, with reads and, uh, and, and power supply bills that are coming through. And what about, and, and to Phil's question about bills, I know we're going to have is some that, forgiveness on um, is that on work. Is, we, is that on here or no? Do you want me to just talk about it? Yeah. Is it on here? That'd be great. Uh, Pauline's answer on the low drop. Pauline, what did you say to that? Um, Chuck, do you have an answer to that? Do you want to speak to that? I, I didn't realize that Chuck walked in. Chuck Underhill is our um, integrated resources and power supply wholesale retail director. Okay. Uh, good evening, especially to those of you uh, at home. Uh, that sounded like Dave Hennessy, so I'm 
Yes, it was. <laughs> so you're, you're trying it out from the audience's perspective this evening. Okay. All right, let me uh, take the questions in reverse order. Uh, as far as a load drop, uh, nothing uh, that we have seen yet. Uh, that's going to be something that's going to take a slightly sustained period of time to look at, and we have to factor out weather conditions. It's been warmer than usual, therefore the, the heating load would be down anyway. So uh, nothing that we've seen untoward. Um, but we, we do continue to watch that. Um, our biggest concern would be the major manufacturers in the area and uh, what the potential uh, load drop from them would be while uh, retail impacts uh, will be significant to the economy. They are not the largest load. They tend to be lighting and uh, in some instances uh, miscellaneous refrigeration. So, um, Possibility that it would go up. The residential will help to sustain uh, the loads that we have, but uh, residential is about 40% of our total retail load, 60% uh, in the commercial area, and of that, uh, we've got about 35% in our top 20 accounts. So uh, my suspicion is that we're more than likely to see uh, a slight decrease, particularly the longer uh, there are measures taken or the more aggressive uh, those measures uh, become to attempt to curtail the uh, COVID virus. Um, the grocery stores themselves, their loads are way up uh, simply because uh, they're moving so much uh, refrigerated and frozen product through. Um, also, the, the, the shelves are uh, cleared of pretty much everything in inventory. So uh, traffic through there uh, is, is helping things. Um, this is going to be a topsy-turvy situation for a while, but we are keeping an eye on it uh, in terms of loads. Now, uh, if I might take a moment to speak to the revenue uh, aspects of that, um, we are not going to uh, shut off any residential accounts. Um, we will work with them. Uh, we would like to. We also have to protect the other ratepayers on the on the system as well. Um, and so we will work uh, with our customers, residential and commercial, uh, to establish uh, what I would call probably a more lenient approach to uh, managing uh, revenue. Uh, impacts coming in. Uh, we still need to write checks. We have to write checks for about five and a half to six and a half million dollars uh, a month for power supply. Uh, I'm in the process of digging out the most recent power supply budget that we got from Energy New England so that I can send that to Wendy and she will have an idea of what our cash flow requirements are going to be over the next six months to pay the power supply bills. Uh, we're coming into a slow period, so the, the costs will be down a little bit, but depending on how far this goes into the summer, uh, we will be in our maximum uh, cash flow months. So uh, we're striking a balance. Uh, we are being fair. We are being understanding. Um, and uh, that's the most I can tell you right now. Thank you. Well, excuse me, what would be the typical shutoff cycle for a customer if, if it was for, you know, for non payment? Um, it usually goes about 45 days, and then they start to get notices. And in about 60 days, I believe, uh, is the shutoff notice uh, that first goes out. Uh, you can look it up. Uh, I believe we have it posted on our site, but it's certainly available on the DPU. We follow the DPU protocols. Okay. 
Dave, can I add something? Please. So uh, the state had sent in a letter about extending the moratorium for residential um, with, with the uh, situation, um, this unprecedented situation that's going on. But typically, we work with the customers on payment plans, and we will continue to do that. Um, we do that across for all cla classifications. And so we, we will continue to do that um, and work, as Chuck says, work with the customers. Great. Anything more on this topic, Phil? Well, if if it comes to push to shove, I mean, is there a plan to cut expenses somewhere, if need be? Has it emerged as a backup plan? Well, at this point right now, based on, you know, the, the two to three months of operating uh, funds, uh, this rate stabilization, this is exactly the conversation that we talked about in the state of emergency. So right now we're not expecting to spend or drain any of that. As Chuck says, we have no indication of loss of load or anything. Um, you know, combine that with a coincident failure, that may be a different aspect, but we're going to track this as we go. Um, as Chuck says, we have to pay our bills, so we may, may be kind of swapping some money around within the funds to do so. Um, but, you know, I'm going to be presenting six uh, bid bids, and you may say to me, why are you buying all those transformers now in the middle of this? Well, I will tell you what, if we don't put in our order now, try buying a laptop. We got to put our orders in and we have to make sure that we have the equipment that we need in order to keep people in power. So um, we don't have a lot of expenses that are, uh, you know, it's only like, tw what, what are we, 20%? Of our operating is, is is expenses, and the rest is power supply, and that's a pass through. So mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of fat in there to do that. Okay. So, but we do have to continue um, to to keep stock in. You know, you've seen what it's like when we have a hurricane in Florida. We may not be able to get metal. Metal prices go up. We can't get equipment. When you have uh, corporations that are making switchgear and in, in, in transformers and wire and stuff that just, you know, their their employees have gone home for a couple of months. You could go from a 16-week delivery to a 50-week delivery. So we need to be in the queue. So we got to keep going as if, you know, to make sure we're going to be okay. Yeah, so I mean, if I may add to that, just uh, one comment, and that's because we've been running very, very lean, as you know, at the RMLD, extremely lean. We've got uh, probably a number of positions positions that I've not filled for a couple of years now. Uh, so, and correct me if I'm wrong, Pauline, but I think we're still down from our, where our um, expected uh, person count should have been. We, we are down right now, but we, we have a reorganization uh, structure that's in front of the unions. Um, we intend to still fill those positions uh, based on succession and, and pending retirements. Uh, those are going to be filled. It's just that they were new job descriptions and reorganizational structures. Uh, we will not ever be, probably be as high as the, the RMLD was at one point with about 82 or 83 people. Uh, but we are, we are uh, below, you know, I would say below sufficient staffing by about um, seven or eight people between the line department and um, and some of the succession positions of people that are going to be retiring within the next year. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I, 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 one question on that. I, are you afraid of this, the EOPs? Um, yes. This is continuity plan EOPs. Um, obviously, one's for virus people. Do you have other ones for? Like facilities and one for systems. I, I'm assuming that you do. Yeah. So I just because you know Murphy's law, something bad's going to happen on top yeah. of a virus. It'll be right. like something's going to blow up. And right. No, we have, uh, you know, the standard. I shouldn't say standard. Wrong word. We have EOPs, which are emergency operating procedures, and we have SOPs, which are standard operating procedures, and we have those in each of the divisions. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing. We didn't really have an EOP specific for a virus, but we had an EOP for other electrical issues. So some of them you can use, and some of them you have to put an asterisk and add like a virus section to your plan. For, so for example, 
if there's a transmission issue because there's a lack of transmission staff with National Grid or Eversource, um, it still could result in, in a load reduction to us and we would still have to implement an EOP in order to redistribute the load within our system. So there are some EOPs that we can um, revise slightly for a virus. But even like when you're looking at load in the summertime, you may want to stream your feeders towards a mall that has air conditioning and everyone comes together, right? Because, you, but in a virus, you want everybody home and you want residents in power. So we're going through each of those and just making sure that our emergencies are, are, are key. Um, you know, IT as well, you got IT infrastructure that, that supports a lot of our, you know, control rooms and things like that. Can I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yes. We have people, places, and, yep. and systems, right? You gotta, you gotta talk about all three. Okay. All right. Okay. So I, think, I think at this point in time, we can, thanks Chuck, and thanks everybody. Yep. If we can go back to item six, and uh, the update on our discussions about the payment to the town of Reading. There's kind of three parts to this. We'll, you know, we had put some things on the table as a starting point early in January, and, um, that we sent those out for feedback. We now have some feedback from the CAB, the Citizen, Citizens Advisory Board, and from the Select Board. So, Colleen, if you, and then Colleen has, just give us a, has given a memo that's in the board book about her current thoughts. So do you want to walk us through those three pieces? Yeah. Um, are you familiar with, are you like just a little recap? Okay, good. Um, so, back in 2018, and Wendy Markowitz, who's not here, she's our Director of Business Finance, and I were looking at the projections going forward and um, the town of Reading payment was based on a CPI increase every year um, and because we are limited to making up to 8% of net plant but generally in order to stay competitive with the rest of the municipals um, around 6% is where we between 45 to 6% is where we need to land because there was a lack of maintenance really done uh, here for uh, many years, a couple of decades, uh, we came up with a capital improvement plan that we increased that rate of return in order to put some money to, to make these changes quickly. Um, and they were, the failure analysis on poles and transformers was going faster than something that you could just do a long-term plan or bonding on or whatever. So the study that I did showed that there would be a convergence between what was being paid to the town and, uh, and where we were going to be landing on our rate of return, and it was crossing. So I just, you know, told the board that we needed to retake a look at the formula um, and go from a CPI, and my study had said go to a, a, a mills per kilowatt hour sales, which was more indicative of the health of the, of the utility. Um, I was asked to get a, a, basically a second study opinion, which we asked Energy New England to do, and they pretty much came up with the same thing with around three mills being uh, the target area. Um, we pay out two uh, in lieu of tax payment. One is below the line to the town of Reading, uh, which is about $2.5 million a year. And then we pay out above the line about $1.5 million, and that's 2% of net plant that's then distributed to each of the towns, including Reading, based on their load. So uh, fast forward. Um, you know, uh, coming down from the 2.5 with a loss of kilowatt hours down to about 3 mils showed a loss to the town. The town, my understanding is they were looking for a, a sense of stability. Um, you know, a loss of any kind of money is, is, a, is an adverse impact to their operations and budget. But at the same time, I have a fiduciary duty to the, the customers of the RMLD. It is a voluntary payment by law under Chapter 164. Wendy and I have scrubbed the data over and over and over again. Uh, we were extremely appreciative and grateful that the town sent in some proposals, um, but those proposals were related to a revenue formula instead of a kilowatt hour formula. So I will, um, that kind of catches me up, it catches us up a little bit. Sure. So, so. We'll be a quiz on this later, Bob. Yeah, Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. I, yeah. I, I, have the, I have the financial chart in my pocket okay. if anybody wants to see it. <laughs> so basically the memo says that Wendy and I had had a chance to review the payment proposals uh, from the town of Reading. 
The RMLD does not recommend, and this is consistent with my original plan. The actually the Bob the, the studies of my 2018 and the E and E are both on the website under Board of Directors on the left hand side. You can find all of the studies that that were done in your in folder. My, in oh, my folder. Good. <laughs> Excellent. Um, the RMLD does not recommend a formula based on revenue. Um, base revenue is the only component the, the RMLD can control to ensure that the RMLD covers its cost of production, which is a law. As a reminder, power supply is uh, approximately 75% of the budget and is purely a pass-through, which means we, don't, we can't make that up to 8% on power supply. It's whatever comes in goes out, there's nothing. <laughs> By utilizing the revenue or the combination of a revenue and kilowatt hour sales as proposed by the town, um, a base rate increase, and right now unlikely based on an increase in sales uh, to support our operations would result in the town receiving that increase or a portion thereof, resulting in a higher rate increase to the RMLD customers. The combination of the revenue and uh, kilowatt hour negates the RMLD's ability to strategize, to stabilize its rate of return, capital funds, kilowatt hour sale fluctuation, cost of living, and operational business in general. The RMLD understands and appreciates that the Town of Reading's concerns and the intent of their proposals. The RMLD remains focused on its original two studies in that a unit of kilowatt hour sales is the best business model for the RMLD. While sales have a flat to slight decreasing trend for the short term, the recent capacity auction came in lower than projected, but the transmission costs are escalating. But a slight margin emerged. We have reanalyzed our previous recommendations. While we are confident that the escalated above industry trend, above the study, which was three mils, uh, but our recommendation was of 3.75 mils of kilowatt hour sales adjusted annually by audited financials, remains acceptably commensurate with our fiduciary duty for the RMLD and its customers an upgraded recommendation that supports the town's need for stability but allows for fluctuations in the RMLD business is as follows. Based on the current RMLD financial projections, move, we will move the recommendation to four mils per kilowatt hour for five years and reevaluate in four years for commensurate, for com commensurate for commencement in the next five year term relative to, con to continued fiduciary duty utilizing a unit mills per kilowatt hour formula. So that small little margin, uh, absent of um, you know this now pandemic, gave us a little bit of room there to try to get the number closest to, it's actually slightly a little bit higher than what we pay out the town now. Mm -hmm. We could lock that in for five years. There's another number of systems, municipal lights, there's 41 in the state, who do use uh, a 10-year, five-year lock-in, uh, and they base their financials around that uh, without, without increasing the rates to cover the payment, because by law we're not supposed to do that. So Wendy and I feel like based on, I mean, unless, unless of course, because we've been talking from the beginning, if there's a catastrophic event, no one may get any payment. Right. But we feel confident in the money that we have in our operating fund to be able to get through the pandemic and to also be able to provide for this recommendation. So um, I'm speaking on behalf of Wendy as well, but you know we, we, we both endorse this recommendation. But it, we, we pretty much have exhausted our analysis on this. Um, the original study in 2018, pretty comprehensive what I put together, the assumptions and everything pretty much remain. The, the one thing to add to that, if you could just add that, although they didn't vote, this the cab did wait. The cab. Yeah, they weighed in at the last meeting. We mentioned it briefly. Yeah. The cab is the, the cab has not been given this memo and this recommendation. Yeah. Um, I know we were interested in, in discussing it here. No, I mean, to, I mean to convey what. No, they, I know, but I haven't sent this to them, so they sure. haven't reviewed this. So yeah. what I'm going to read is my excerpt of their minutes that are in draft that they haven't looked at yet. Yep. So that's why I can't put this in the board book. But yep. you were there, Dave, so this was my understanding yep. of the last um, set of proposals, including the town's proposals. The Citizens Advisory Board regarding the options for the payment to the town as follows. Nothing that would compromise the RMLD's ability to continue to provide dependable, reliable power at an affordable price for all towns. 
there is a preference or a desire that the payments not be tied to revenue, but rather to kilowatt hour sales. The CAB acknowledged the town's desire for some predictability in the payment and is willing to consider a mechanism to allow for such predictability, i.e. setting some thresholds or basing payments on RMLD's budget planning process an amount two, three, two to three years out that the town of Reading could take into their budgeting process. And four, a review of the formula should take place every few years based on the previous actual numbers. So that was their comments based on the last proposals from Wendy and I and the town's proposals. And at this point, if I understand, you would like, we would all like them to also look at this new amended proposal that you've come, that you've come up with. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that's what, so then any more discussion on this? Um, yeah, so then if the 4%, what would be their, based upon what that number is, what would be the payment to the town? Would it be more than what it is now? It's, it's slightly a little bit more. Yeah. I, I don't have the table with me. Um, no. So I, I read the memo. Do I understand? Because I know we talked about some t with having a floor, so it'd be a, a straight payment. For it the would next just five be four mills. Um, so no matter what the kilowatt hours so is, yeah, it would we be would four mills. We calculate four mills right now, okay. and then it would stay that for five years. So if we see a drop in the kilowatt hours, nothing changes for five years. Nothing. So it's a, a set amount for five years. Correct. The set, the, the set factor, but the the amount could magnitude of the actual payment could go up or down of the below the line. So it basically so provides for... Because it's four mills uh, times whatever the kilowatt hour sales are. Right. But on the, on the, other, on the other hand, in the in proposals from January, it was 3.75 mills. And that would have come up with a roughly the same magnitude of the below the line as it's been for the last right. two years, the 2.48. It was slightly below. This one's a little slightly above. And, and the last proposals were 3.75. We had a couple of them, and it, and it kind of ratcheted down to three, and then stated three. Right. And you would, and you would change it every year based on your audited financials. And then there was another option where you just kept it flat. Right. Okay. And so this one is using that little bit of margin, bumping it up to four mills, locking it in for five years. And then in the fourth year, we would say, okay, based on the next five years. What, what can we afford? Revisit it. Revisit it. Yeah. Okay, so, so let, let me understand. You know, we got we got the payment a little bit above where we are now. That's year one. Year two, same payment. Same. Or year three, same, same formula. Same, same year same. four, year five. Same formula. Same, but based same on payment. the previous year's kilowatt hour sales. Based, so it you, could you, it could no. do this. You set it based on four mills right now. Same five years. So it's going to be the same payment for the next right. five years. So let's say four mills okay. of kilowatt hour sales is two point five million. Okay. Two point five million. Okay. In four years, you say okay. Next time, it's going to be based on four mills again. Okay. It's four mills, and you go forward. So it's the same. It would be the same dollar amount. Same okay. dollar amount. Sorry, my, I was I misspoke. Yeah. So if, when if, would that period begin? For at the end of well, we're we're actually locked in to the last payment of 2.48 million until the end of this year correct correct right. the end of this calendar year right which is two right. payments per calendar year but it's their fiscal year so which year's kilowatt hour sales becomes the basis for each of the next five years it has to be the previous uh, um, audited financials so the next the next payment will be the same I think it would that payment is I believe June 30th or is it July okay, 3rd? June in, in December June and December. So the next payment is already locked in. So this would be the payment that's coming in December. A, a, well, that will be effective yeah. for de the December payment. Yes. I'll double check that, but I believe we're a, there's a locked payment for June and December of this year. But and if we double check. And if I we have a catastrophic event, all bets are off. We As always, I suppose, it. right? I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, we have a pandemic going on now. I, right, I'm yeah. a little bit concerned about, you know, where, where we're going to be if this thing can, I mean, I heard somebody the other day said this could have gone for 18 months. Just to, to clutch is scary. <laughs> it is, yeah. I want to just make sure I understand. The year at which you will multiply it by four mils is 2020, is 2019, is the, which yeah. year would it be? It would be the last audited financials. So right now we do not have audited financials yet for, for 2019. We're working on those. Okay, so that 
the, the year for which the sales will be used, it will be 2019. It would be audited financials for 2019, okay. correct. So that the formula will not be based on a pandemic-related, if there is a pandemic-related change. If anything, it makes it higher because last year would be okay. high because the economy was roaring, right? Right, but if we get in, this kind of ties back into our earlier discussion. Okay. If the revenue isn't there, right. you have to remember, these bottom line is coming from the top line, the rate that the, that the uh, rate payers are paying. Yep. I, I, got, I got the chart in my pocket if we want to put it back up again. Yeah. Um, you know, That's it's the second time you've threatened to do that. So I know. <laughs> we might have to let you do it. But anyway, go ahead, Phil. What, so what's your point? The point is I'm thinking, you know, if this pandemic goes quite a ways and affects, you know, your commercial customers, you know, it it could very well be that that payment may not be sustainable. I hate to say that. That's a concern. It's a concern I have. Let me speak, uh, Please, John. Uh, yeah, Phil, no, I agree with you. I think that uh, there, something could happen. You just never know that uh, Black Swan is going to come out and come find you, right? Uh, like the Columbia Gas thing uh, did years ago. Uh, and so that's why there's no floor on this. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no floor. In other words, if uh, something catastrophic happens, all bets are off. We have to preserve the system. We have to preserve the service to our customers. And just be, we just have to do it uh, as it happened. Correct me if I'm wrong, colleague. No, that's that's the assumption. So it, if I can understand, if I can understand what those two points are. The formula would be fixed and it would be based only on 2019 and it would be the exact same dollar amount for the five years under this proposed formula. It would, okay, so I guess what we're all saying is if there is a catastrophe, we got to revisit the formula. And there's nothing in our vote for five years that says we can't, in the event of a catastrophe, go back and change it. And like, like, any, like any board could at any time. You, right, you, right? you, you have to... Sure. Yeah, please, Dave. Colleague, can I ask why the five-year window? Why not just have it be formulas of the previous years? Kilowatt hour sales that sets the, uh, the pilot payment for the next year, and they just do it every year. Why? Why a five-year chunk? Well, because we we had that as an option. And what we were trying to do was take into consideration the town's concern about stability. Right. And, and, I, and we had a discussion where I said, well, the town wants stability, but oftentimes the RMLD doesn't know its stability. So we're looking at what we have. We're, right now we're not at a convergent state that's in my study. So for right, we're, so if we just do five year chunks, we say okay for this five years, this is what we can afford. This, right. this you know, we don't have to raise the rate to pay that. Right. Um, and it's pretty much even with what we had been paying the town. Right. So it's not going up by CPI. You know, so it, there is a preservation there which stops the convergence. And by stopping it at four years or reevaluating in four years, um, you get to have the payment be somewhat consistent with the six-year plans that we put together, so that we know what's ha what we think our projections are for power supply, capital improvements, everything that we're trying to do in our business model. Aside from a catastrophe, aside from a pandemic. Um, Wendy and I feel like that this is a sustainable amount that we can do for five years. Um, yeah, and, and it provides the town the stability and it doesn't take away from our stability for our plans in the short term, meaning one to five years. Yeah, I'll just add that, you know, you got to give the town stability. I mean, if you've gone up, up and down each year, that's just not, not the way it should be for the town. You know, it should be stable should be some sort of stability they can depend on so they know what they're going to get because they have to set their budgets each year. Yep. Right. Um, I think that the first year one would be something like $100,000 more than it's been because the the thing, the proposals from January were 3.75. It came close to the what the number is now. It wasn't quite there, but it was close. This would be 6.6%. So going from 3.75 to 4 is a 6.6 percent increase. Right. So it's going to probably add a hundred thousand dollars, 
Well, my apologies for not putting the table in, um, okay. but I can I can get it's I can get them from Wendy, and okay. we can you know put it on the website tomorrow with this memo. It's all fine. Yep. Um, and me, you know, I'm not trying to make excuses, but between the emergency response teams that we've been having here every day and the one I'm on at the town, we're, we're, we're really... Right. We have, you got, you got, you got other busy. Other issues to deal with. To 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 other issues to deal with. And one way to triangulate yeah. these concerns is to do a moving average. Like, you wouldn't do it just based on one year every year and have it change a lot every year, but you also wouldn't want to fix it to 2019 if things went dramatically down, one way to solve that would be to do a three-year moving average. So the amount that it could go up and down would be very little, and you're already starting from a good so chunk higher than what it is now. The, the, the first thing someone's going to say is five years is too long. You, know, you go to town meeting and someone's going to say five years is a long period of time. Things. There's a pro and a con. Could, well, could go down. Yeah. Right? Three years might be something. But what, how does three years impact running lights long-term planning? If you said well, a three-year contract versus yeah. a five-year. Well, we do six-year plans. We, uh, we we look at the year where we're finishing up, and then we project out. We, we got the capacity markets. Uh, a lot of that's passed through. But we do our capital plans uh, for 20, 25 years, and we back it in. Right. Um, what we've been doing with that is we've been doing failure analysis on every single piece of equipment. So, you know, you look at the poles, and again, because 30. of the lack of maintenance. So we have the plan pretty tight. Um, we do have some vacancies, but those need to be filled. So we, we feel like we have the expense and capital budget pretty tight, except for this pandemic. Um, and so it fits into that. I mean, there are other utilities that lock in for 10 years. It's it's not that it's not as much money. They don't pay out as much money as two you know 2.5 million. But there are certain other utilities that lock in for 10. Um, I mean, Wendy and I are willing to look at whatever analysis you'd want me to do. I mean, right now today, we we can do that. I, I don't know about tomorrow with the pandemic hitting us. I. Right. But, but I think also, you know, to maybe address Bob's thing, if the whole key thing is I think there has to be economic development. We've been saying that for a long time. Right. The towns have to get do some economic development. I mean, if they're able to go, maybe HQ, you know, at the headquarters comes over and, you know, takes the property behind us or something. You know, we can always in year four, we look at the formula again. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're saying we can look at it if it goes down, but I don't see why we can't look at it if it goes up. Yeah, it's true. And the only other thing I'd add to the mix, Bob, is that we've been running around this tree for three years about how to redo this formula. <laughs> so I, I just, it, it takes up so much uh, civic life and, and political uh, energy. I, I, I mean that, like, we, we have, like, concrete things that we want to work on, the town does too. So there's, that's an argument for doing it for longer, knowing that if we have to change it, we can. The board can always vote and change it, but I think it's better to set something for longer right. than, to, than to know we got to do this again in two or three years. You know what I'm saying? Can I add a note about the economic? I mean, I know we had to cancel our home information sessions that we run in each of the towns. Yep. We did manage to get our one in Linfield. Um, Chuck's group rolled out our new heat pump uh, rebates. Uh, we, we added uh, thanks to the Climate Action Committee's input, uh, we added uh, um, electrical panel upgrades, whether it's a panel or a smart panel, uh, for people, you know, maybe they want to add more electricity, they upgrade their panel. Chuck's group is working on outside appliances and stuff for, for this coming year for more up, up, updates um, and upgrades. Uh, we did send out a letter. I sent out a, a letter to each of the town managers with a request for information that I'm going to send out in April if I don't hear back from the towns, and that's building rooftops for our third uh, solar community solar. Um, so each of the four towns, we, we targeted building tops. The town managers can get back to me as to whether they they like what the buildings I've selected, they want to add some, remove some. But that's a, you know, my letter says that's a win-win for the town for, um, you know, a lease payment, uh, property tax, and then we get to uh, roll that, that offtake into our uh, power supply portfolio. So there's, there's some room there for growth um, uh, that, that we're hoping for. I mean, the electric vehicles didn't come in exactly where we thought. I mean, they're kind of delayed another year for that 
transition. We're, we're working with Volta for implementing uh, charging stations at, at Market Basket in um, uh, Jordan's and, and Walmart. So we got a lot going on uh, in, in our campaign in, of electrification. Final word, please. Final word, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to express my support for what the gentleman is presenting tonight. Yeah, I, I, I feel the same way. And I, and I would just ask, and, and with the support of the board, is to if you could generate, you know, write out what the formula is, or m maybe if there's a couple of different tweaks, there's a moving average one, there's one that's based on the previous year, and, and lay out the tables, and we can have it on the next agenda. And hopefully, well, obviously, in the next month, we'll hear from the CAB again, we'll hear from the select board and others, and maybe we can even vote on, on a new formula in, in the April meeting. Okay. Potentially. Well, does that sound? Sounds fine. I have Anywhere from the to put that on. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a month until the next meeting. I'm just saying. I know, but I'll try to get it on there Monday. I just, yeah. I, I just yeah, yeah. if I can get it done by tomorrow. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. I mean, just yeah, next yeah. week sometime. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So that's great. Um, anything you want to add, we, Mark, Doxer, to all this? I don't know if you're still there. Mark, you got your microphone. Yeah. Okay. He's, he's, been, he's, been, he's been talking for 15 minutes. Yeah. We're all trying to figure out how to, how to work through this. Very much appreciate your, uh, your understanding of this issue of stability. Um, it just, it, it's, it's very helpful. And, you know, again, we're in very uncharted waters yep. you know, with, with the pandemic. And, you know, look, this is the, uh, you know, there's a very famous quote from Ben Franklin I've been using very frequently lately. And, and the quote is, we must all hang together, but most assuredly, we shall all hang separately. Exactly. Right. Very yep. good. So on that note, um, yeah, exactly. Um, Come on, Mr. Chair. Okay, so we thank you very much. Um, and so now we're we're just on your um, your vacation, your report, and your vacation uh, motion here. Right. Move, I'll move that the uh, board of commissioners allow the general manager to carry forward any unused vacation time from 2019 into 2020 due to extenuating circumstances to be used in the second quarter of 2020. Okay. Oh, that uh, second, you could, you could say, there you go. Motion. Is that right? We good? Yeah, I we just, need. I don't want to keep coming back and asking, but it's like, so I made plans in April. I don't know if you can fly domestically. I don't know. You cannot. Yeah. So we can, but. I, maybe I'll just stay home and plant my garden, but. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. We have a motion and a second. And uh, the, the, Yo, John. Oh, just a quick question. Uh, hi, uh, we haven't met yet. I'm sorry. But you, it's just my name. I just want to make sure you've been sworn in correctly. That's correct. Okay, good. I just want to make sure. So, so otherwise, you'd have to abstain. I just want to make sure. No, I, I, I was sworn in today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, that's, we have a motion and a second. Right. All in favor? Pacino, Mr. Pacino, you got to take a roll call. we got to take a roll call. Mr. Pacino, aye. Mr. Pacino, aye. Mr. Tom and I. Bob Coulter, aye. Okay, all right. Okay. Very good then. Uh, update on the ransomware. Okay, so um, we had a cyber event, and technically we can't really qualify it or classify it as a ransomware. Um, I, I just want to explain to everyone that, you know, what your IT configuration is, what you do for backups. Those type of things are things that you do not want to discuss publicly. Right. Okay. It creates vulnerability for the business and it creates vulnerability Absolutely. for the customers. We did not have any customer compromise of information. We actually don't even have any customer information that you wouldn't be able to get at the town hall, but nothing was compromised. Um, it is, I, I do understand that the towns were actually asking me more to help them uh, understand how to be better prepared. And so we had a meeting with all the town managers, um, and we offered an IT meeting between the ITs between the towns to meet, to dive a little bit deeper into the incident. Um, uh, what I can say is that, um, again, I'm not even going to discuss what we do. What I can tell everybody out there is if you, we use the best of breed in all of our software protection. We're running an electric utility. 
and we we take backups very seriously and we believe in making sure that our software is updated exactly when it needs to because um, if you delay in, in, in updating patches and things like that, you create a vulnerability between people that want to disrupt your system of knowing that there's an issue and you delaying to make that change. So I would just recommend to everyone and did it with the towns, uh, we're, we're more than happy to help them. Uh, what lessons learned that we did have from this uh, was, um, you know, I was home on a Saturday vetting through disaster IT recovery consultants. Um, not all IT consultants are disaster recovery, so you have to, don't, don't wait until it happens to try to start vetting that, so have one on, on board. Uh, there's a little bit of discussion about um, communication, um, you know, letting the towns know, don't let the towns know, um, sending out press releases on, on those are the types of things that we're going to work with the IT consultant. That information comes from the FBI and Homeland Security, depending on what it, what happened or what, what happens to you. But this happens to people at home. It happens to all businesses. This is fairly new within the last two years. Um, if you use best of breed software and you use best, best IT practices, you have the best chance of, of it being um, a better outcome. And I'm very proud of my IT team, uh, and um, and that's really all I got to say on that. Thank you. Can I ask a question on that? Sure. Just a very, very quick one. Actually, it's, a, it's an address to Bob, because I know you spent a long time with National Grid. I don't know if you came across this in terms of uh, uh, what is especially in the future, any best practices that you come across would be, we really appreciate knowing about them. And, uh, sharing them with us. Um, no, one of the questions I had, I, I just to know if the IT team was there, was a vendor, or it's internal. We, we, we're yeah. using, we have an internal IT division, and we have external um, IT consultants um, because we have IT infrastructure, and then we also have NERC requirements with uh, NERC. with your electric utility. So it's a it's a combination um, effort. Right. Um, I. I, I you know, just stand this up. Two, two factor authentic. Yep. You know, authentication. Thank you. Big word. Yes. Can't get it out of my mouth. But, um, but that's a, that. That's pretty much a standard that we. Everything was analog. Everything's moved, moving away from analog. Now you're making everything smart grid, and you open up smart grid, and the technology moves faster than the security. It's just all, always the way that it goes, and you're always in the mode of playing catch up. Yes. And um, that's just the the, the 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 wave of technology. You know, you want things quicker, faster, and you want to be able to hit a button and watch it, but at the same time, there's a back door. There's always a back door that you just don't realize, right. so you have to stay on top of it, right. and then there's a balance between how fast you go and how far you go and protection, and exactly. you can spend all the money in the world of protection, but it's going to be useless in a week. Right. Right. So. I mean, hacker uh, right. yeah, hackers exploit exploits, so you, you have to, you know, that's their job, so... Um, you know, we just want to protect the electric system and the reliability, and um, and we will we'll share whatever we can to help people. But there's lessons to be learned at the at the end of any incident. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're ready for uh, uh, Chuck Underhill's report. And can I ask before I forget? Can I ask a small favor? I think we there's a lot of this um, solar rebate fund unspent, right? The DOER MLP. And if people don't do something by July 1, the money is lost and goes back to the state treasury. Is that also true? That is currently true. Whether or not uh, DOER will be able to get an extension yep. uh, of that grant program due to either extenuating circumstances yep. uh, right now or uh, an interest in uh, continuing yep. the development. So it could change. I guess my request was going to be um, maybe some, if it's okay with you, some kind of public release of, of, a, of a press release or something that would let folks know that it could be a use it or lose it situation in the next three months. Um, 
Because it would be a shame if Chuck can have Joyce do it. Um, is that residential only or commercial? Is it? It's both, right? It's based on it's a dollar twenty a watt. You know, it's a big rebate only for, only for MLPs, and the state is paying for it. Yep. You know, the grant is size based, so uh, as long as the system is under a certain size, it can be commercial or uh, residential over that size. Uh, typically, commercial systems we offer a different. Uh, rebate structure. And I think the threshold is 25, um, 25 kilowatt hours, right? 10 kilowatt, not hours. So, what, what would that be? Maybe 30 panels or something? No, more than that. 50 panels, something like that. Um, so, a, a good size, a decent size system. You, well, you would know. Oh, yeah, I, I was just yeah, 20. I, I, I was just kind of curious. I didn't know. It, w w Where's the void, right? Is it on the residential side? Is it on the commercial side? If right. you're offering it, no one's asking for it. Right. What, what, where's the... Well, I mean, we had this discussion a little bit. I, I think what happens in an MLP is that, um, different from an IOU, is, you know, our, our prices are so much lower that yeah. there's a, a, a quicker rate of return when you install one on an IOU mm -hmm. system. Yeah. It isn't that folks here, you know, that we compete with the IOUs and you're doing more solars than we are, I mean, you are, but it, it's based on the rate of return. I mean, if we have 15 cent power and, and an IOU has 23 cent, um, the customer has to invest pretty heavily in the, in the system, uh, not for much of a savings, you know, not much for much of a return. Um, and so I think that's what what drives it. I mean, yeah. th this is this is why we've gone towards. And I wonder if we can use that money towards the solar garden if if the residents are investing in the panels on the solar garden. Why wouldn't we be able to have them redirect the money through them for the p investing in the panel that they're going to own on the roof? In terms of a rebate to them Correct. for the panels. Can that, you look at that. Yeah. I mean, that's a great way of investing in green, um, you know. No idea already. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, well, thank you for that. Um, so, we're ready for your report at this right, point. But now you're going to get that done by July. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> <it's just laughs> pandemic or not, let's go. <laughs> I mean, I can write it for you if you want. Thanks, Dave. Just offering. Well, <laughs> um, what we have, uh, we <laughs> begun by putting uh, some comparative information where our budget, where power supply trends are going, to kind of set the stage for uh, what we see happening. We are in an unbelievably volatile period uh, for power supply right now. Uh, I took a screenshot uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the end of February, and the uh, peak period uh, marginal energy price was about $15 a megawatt hour. Uh, our budget, uh, by way of example, is around $75 a megawatt hour on peak for the winter period. So uh, it's crazy out there. And uh, the current uh, Russian-Saudi battle to see who can hit the bottom of the barrel first uh, is further exacerbating things. I stopped and uh, got gasoline uh, earlier this week, $1.97. Uh, nine a gallon, and my wife tells me it was a dollar eighty-five nine a gallon at Costco. Well, I mean, none of us ever expected well, to see below two dollars yeah. a gallon. Certainly not in the winter time. I paid that this morning. <laughs> two dollars a gallon, or under two dollars. Under two dollars. Yeah. So very topsy turvy uh, mm -hmm. pricing. So um, what we've got up here is a comparison of. Uh, the temperatures that we've been experiencing. Um, one of the things that we have noticed uh, that the wintertime average temperature has been significantly higher uh, because most of the heating is uh, fuel oil, natural gas, and propane. 
Uh, we don't see quite as much of an impact on that uh, for in terms of loss of electric sales. Um, but uh, it is uh, a rather dramatic impact uh, on the economy. So uh, other companies are coming into the pandemic without the revenues that they expected to have uh, coming out of the winter. Um, so, uh, and if you take a look, uh, I believe that uh, the right-hand side of the, the slide is the uh, temperature versus the um, daily megawatt hour uh, consumption for RMLD. Uh, so just some interesting ways of looking at uh, the temperature and uh, kilowatt hour consumption uh, values that we see out there. And why it's also very difficult uh, at the beginning of the countermeasures to the pandemic to identify whether we're seeing uh, kilowatt hour load reduction effects uh, as a result of the pandemic. So, um, next slide, please. So, we, uh, we've taken uh, positions in power supply uh, through the rest of 2020. We are at about 95% of our anticipated uh, portfolio requirements uh, in terms of subscriptions. And um, we've gone ahead and uh, mapped out uh, our resources against the load uh, so that you can see uh, how they fit into uh, this portfolio. I'm assuming that the other commissioners online have uh, access to uh, the presentations. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, um, next slide, please. Chuck, before you get off that slide, um, one of the things that I got, I got, my clients is concerned about their supply chains. Is there any concern about any of these suppliers with we, the pandemic that's going on here? Um, only the, they're concerned that they get paid, but um, we have quite a uh, variety in our mix. We uh, deal with a number of different vendors and we deal with a number of different fuel types. Um, the single largest vendor that we deal with uh, is Nextera and they are uh, the world's largest supplier of uh, renewable and non-carbon uh, energy. Uh, they are uh, very uh, financially stable. We don't expect that they will have uh, any disruptions. Most of the energy that they are providing to us is all out of the New England region, so there's no uh, transmission or importation. Uh, they have firm gas supplies behind that portion of the contract that is gas. Uh, we also uh, take quite a bit of nuclear and in the event that their supply is interrupted, uh, we have a fixed delivery contract, so it doesn't matter what the resource is. It matters how much they deliver, where they deliver it, and when they deliver it. So they would be able to fulfill uh, any contractual obligations that we have uh, out of nuclear resources if uh, there's a problem with another fuel type uh, in their supply chain. And uh, the biggest nuclear resource is uh, obviously about 45 miles north of here. So uh, we do, would not expect any transmission problems. We're pretty comfortable that our resource portfolio is stable, secure, and um, probably virus proof, I guess, is the best way to look at it. Thank you. Next slide, please. So, this is looking at uh, forecasted to actual. Uh, we start uh, obviously with January, we track it uh, through the year to see uh, how well we're doing. And 
uh, over time we will be able to answer the question of how much is uh, weather driven variance and how much uh, is due to you know, other factors whether it is the programs that we're running to modify load uh, profile or uh, external uh, factors such as the uh, pandemic itself or uh, collateral uh, issues such as economic uh, shutdowns. So, um, if you take a look at uh, January, uh, we budgeted a um, little over two and a half million dollars for the energy portion of our uh, power supply portfolio. Uh, we came in uh, very close to that. The cumulative differential is the little green line that you can't see on the graph. So uh, budget to actual and variance for January, um, very close. Uh, next, please. Our transmission costs, um, probably having more to do with uh, the actual uh, peak load for January. We're well below um, expectations, so uh, that portion of the budget uh, is higher than uh, actual. And then the last is capacity. Um, the capacity is fixed. Usually the differentials that we see in capacity are due to uh, prior period adjustments uh, that we get uh, in the market because the capacity cost budget is fixed based on what our load was the previous summer and the auction results three years prior. So, I'm sorry? So total purchase power, um, we are uh, ahead of where we expect it to be in terms of total dollars. Uh, one of the things that uh, occurs to me is that we probably want to start looking at the average price since that will factor in the adjustments to uh, load going forward as well. How long was that contract? Which contract? The one that, that, you, that you had with the power suppliers. The, the um, we, we have two bilateral contracts that are the bulk of our resource uh, portfolio. One is with Exelon. That expires December 31st of this year. The other bilateral uh, contract is with Nextera. That expires December 31st of next year. We have a number of segmented contracts uh, for uh, purchases that we have made under uh, a TFA agreement and I would be glad to go into that uh, offline with you, uh, explain to you what we're doing with that program. Uh, we also have um, energy resources uh, associated with non-carbon or from sources such as uh, solar, wind, and, and hydro generation. Um, we are currently working with the legislature uh, to resolve uh, how we reflect those in our portfolio, what we call them, but uh, those contracts uh, run uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, further into the future, but there are pieces of them based on the units that we're involved with. So we can get you the chart that shows the um, portfolio mix that we have going forward. Thank you. Dave, can I? So the, the pie chart portfolio that I think would help Bob has the contract and the start and end date on it, correct? This Are we all set? Yep. On the power supply, yes. Thank you. Um, I don't have the agenda. I don't know whether the next one is the home. Yes, it is. It is. It is. Okay. I keep going. <laughs> no, I am not. <laughs>
Um, In light of the pandemic, we'll skip the presentation. <laughs> Tracy came in and asked nicely <laughs> if I was going to go through the 30-some-odd slides in the deck for the uh, home presentation, and uh, I said no. Um, you have them in your packet. Uh, I'll just give a brief overview on uh, what they are. But every year uh, in the first quarter, we go into each of the four towns that we serve and we run uh, what we call, I believe, the new homeowners uh, presentation where people can come in, uh, find out about the system, find out about the rates that we offer, uh, payment plan structures, efficiency programs, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the services and uh, ancillary benefits to being an RMLD customer. Uh, those are the 30 slides uh, that have been used. We got through two of the presentations. Linfield was the first, Wilmington was the second. The Reading and North Reading uh, presentations have been put on hold. Uh, pending um, coming out of uh, the uh, social distancing uh, situation that we're in now. So those, those are the 30 slides. Uh, I would encourage you to go through them at your leisure. And uh, if there are questions that uh, any of the commissioners have on that, uh, feel free to uh, pose them and we'll get answers back to you. Thank you. Very good. So we're ready to move on to the bids? Or are we, oh. Um, yeah, I'm, so I'm Hamid again. Okay. I'm Hamid and Wendy and everybody tonight. Do you want to um, yeah. leave this that we can read the presentation on the board book, or do you want to get up and give the presentation? I can go through the presentation real quick. You want me to do that first before the bids? I mean, okay. sure. We can do it quickly, right? I, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Next slide. Um, so just let everybody know our, our outage management system in the new control room, phase one of IVR, which is interactive voice um, response, is essentially the smart meter sends in a signal. It creates a polygon. Uh, we, we're notified that you're in an outage situation. We, we dispatch the crews. Um, there's going to be a... Um, a campaign that's going to launch April 1st. It's basically going to say, do you want to be notified by email, text, or phone call? Um, and then you're going to be able to know that you're in an outage situation. Now, these are unplanned outages, and that's how that works. Uh, the system is expected to go live July 1st, you know, based on the campaign. Now, there's a phase two, um, essentially, the next slide is phase one. It basically tells you how it how it connects and works together uh, with the outage management system and the, and the meters. Uh, that we're using SpryPoint as a software for the customers to call in and sign up for their for this campaign. The phase two um, of this system uh, probably not for another few months, but what that will do is this kind of the same concept, but yet I should be able to draw a polygon and send you out a message for a planned outage, a meter replacement for our, our system-wide meter replacement, peak shredding alerts, or any type of events and things. So a part of the campaign will be like, do you want to be notified about those? But that will be in a second phase. But I think we're going to try to collect all of the information during the first campaign. So any questions on that? Second phase is customer notification system. Next slide just tells you how that's connected in with the Sprite Point software portal for um, getting the customer information. The next slide is a timeline. Uh, the next slide basically just shows you what the uh, a polygon will look at it on in our control room SCADA and what the customer would see on the customer portal, uh, which would be on the website. Um, estimated time, I mean, right now we're using Twitter, so we'll be. We may keep Twitter until we get to phase two, um, but a lot of times we'll say, okay, you're, we send them a note, you're in an outage situation, right? So we get out there, 
we think it might be this. Next thing you know, it's a pine tree. Now I got to go get a crane to move the pine tree. Mm -hmm. So the estimated time of restoration might be question mark. Then it might say an hour. Then I find out it's a pine tree with a crane. It might go to three hours, and then we'll we'll update it as it goes, and that will continue to go out uh, until it's restored. Okay. Uh, we do have. Um, you know, smart switches and things like that, and eventually, the you know the the um, the computers will be able to send out estimates on its own based on repeated type of similar outage situations. Um, the next one it looks like Hamid's Vizio on how this is connected in uh, for the OMS IVR and customer um, notification system. The next slide gets into our uh, routine maintenance programs. Uh, he's giving an update on tree trimming, how many spans we did, um, 15 spans a year to date. That's a five year cyclic through all four towns. Uh, inspections of the feeders, he's listing all the feeders that we've gotten done to date for 2020. Uh, pole inspections, replacements 277 of 518 failed have been set. Uh, 255 of 277 transfers have been completed. We completed our infrared scans uh, and found no hot spots through the month of February. Uh, the manhole inspections that we talked about last month are ongoing and porcelain cutouts I think were like 97 percent complete. Um, those are kind of being looked at as we upgrade the open wire and do other things that are in the system. Um, Maintenance programs, this is kind of a, I, I told them on the phone tonight, this one's a little, um, I think, difficult to understand. I think what we're trying to get at here is, so far year to date, we have replaced 12 aged transformers, but it's a moving target because every year they get a year older. Um, so basically in five years we've done 700 replacement of aged transformers about 120 a year we're getting done and right so when I came here we were about a 50 percent age transformer we're down to 38 percent of our transformer are, are aged over 25 years we have a total of 4057 transformers so um, they're making great progress I think over 705 years is great 120 a year is is really good but we're trying to stay ahead of any type of um, overloading leaks and with the new uh, GIS system and OMS system, I got a transformer load management program going where we're looking at uh, the loads during peak to see if the transformer size correctly. We'll send out a work order to get those upgraded, as well as any EVs that are coming down. And that's why I, I based the EVs, we, we put it on a, um, a time of use rate so that we can monitor um, EVs being, being added to the transformers. The next slide is the reliability indices. Um, we're, we're still below national and regional averages in, in all aspects, uh, so that's great news. Reliable system. The next one is talking about the outages a year to date. I mean, I'm surprised that there's been no vehicle accidents. If you remember last year, those climbed way high. Maybe it's um, the new te no texting law is helping with that, so I was, I was pleasantly surprised to see zero. Um, but these are the outage causes of, of um, as of February 2020. And the next slide is just to show you that we completed the backup generator up here by station one. As you know, that uh, unexpectedly failed. Um, we, we had to dig it up. Uh, we rented one for a while, about 5000 a month to rent it. This is the new one installed. And I, I guess I told you that we were digging it up. We thought it was a foundation to the old stack, and it ended up being these big, huge granite cubes that I fell in love with. So now they're going to be uh, decorating um, our patio. So we've got those saved in the backyard, and we're done. Great, thank you. Do you have any OFCs? How many what? Do you have any OFCs in the ground, oil fuse cutouts in the ground, in the underground system? Um, like the old, instead of a vacuum there switch? May be there may be still some. I don't have that data, but when I can ask Hamid in, in um, Yeah. You know. I asked a question. I didn't hear the question. It was, a, it was a question on equipment. Um, I know the porcelain cutout replacement, that's big in the industry. Get rid of all those parted, parted porcelain cutouts. And then OFCs, they're just hazardous for the crews. Okay. So I know that... that is a big push to get those out. Right. So I, I 
like to see that on there. Yeah, let me ask Hamid and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll email and let you know. Yeah. Um, I would think that they would be on there. If you had any. If we yeah, had you don't have a huge extent, a huge yeah. underground network. It's, it's very limited, so yeah, I don't think there'd be a lot. But let me ask, because it's, it's a good point. Okay. All right, bids. All right, bids, ready? Dave? No, not, not at all. I, I've been the business side, absolutely. Um, that's my, my lacking, uh, that's for sure. All right, ready? For the I think we're ready for some bids. All right. Phil, take it away. Knew that IFB 2020-4 for solid dielectric, hopefully I said that right, pad-mounted switchgear be awarded to Innovative Switchgear Solutions, Inc. for $988,650, three-year contract, pursuant to ch uh, Chapter 164, Section 56D on the recommendation of the General Manager. You want to second that, Bob? Taking a motion. Thank you. Um, go ahead. This is the first time the RMLD is going out for a three-year contract on this. It's a total qual quantity uh, for all three years is 14, five in year one and two, four in year three. The lead time right now is about 16 weeks. Um, two of the bidders were non-responsive. Um, uh, neither included the required dimensional drawings, and RMLD purchased five solid dielectric switchgears last year. The unit price in 2019 was 66650 comparing to the 2020 unit price is a 4% increase. Uh, year two and three unit prices are increased by 2% over previous year, but we feel like by locking in three years, we're locking in a better price. So um, that's Just where we stand with that. We have explain a something to Bob. The reason why you see the land recommendations manager is in this chapter 164, the only jurisdiction we have is over the general manager. We can't reach in and, can't reach in and tell Chuck what to do. Okay. I have to go to the general manager. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why I was being nice when I asked. Well, Although Chuck was saying, yeah, 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 sure. You got to move this. <laughs> Definitely no, overstep my bounds. <laughs> um, how many bids came in for this? Uh, it's on the back. So, um, we got innovative switch gear. Innovative switch gear in Wesco. Okay. We're happy with this. Everybody all set? Yep. Ms. Pacino, I. Mr. Talbot, I. Yes, yeah. Aye. Perfect. Mr. Coulter, I. And Mr. Okay. Stempeck is still in the room? Yeah. Okay. Did you vote for John? He's still there? He has John, you have your microphone on. You just have to say, Mr. Stempeck, I. I, I don't see in there. I. There you go. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we just voted to we just voted to sell the utility to National <laughs> Grid. Ready for the next one? Okay. Mole. Moved it. Moved it. IFP 2020-5 for pole mounted transformers be awarded to Graybar Electric Company Inc. for two hundred and twenty thousand five hundred eighty nine dollars. And Westco Distributing Inc. for six for six thousand seven hundred eighty-seven dollars for a total of two hundred twenty-seven thousand three hundred seventy-six, pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter One Sixty-Four, Section Fifty-Six D, on the recommendation of General Manager. Want to second that, Bob? Second the motion. Yep. Uh, you can see the list on the back. Uh, Gray Bar is the lowest responsive uh, proposer on the single phase pole mount transformer. Wesco was the lowest responsive proposer on the three phase pole mount transformer. Delivery is nine weeks from Gray Bar and 14 to 16 weeks from Wesco. Um, and um, do you want any price comparisons from 2018 or anything? I have ones for each of the values, but if you're interested in it. Well, I don't. I'm always curious how many people bid, though. So if you could just add those to these. On the back, okay. On the on the back of your sheet here, yep. these are all the bidders. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I don't oh, okay, so it's on the computer. Yeah, they're on your. It's on, it's on the computer. It's on the iPad. Yeah. Okay, it's so Graybar, uh, Wesco, Stewart, C. Irby, Howard Industries, uh, Power Sales Group bid twice. Um, Two, two different bids. Okay, Mr. Chair. Yes, Ms. Pacino, I. Ms. Talbot, I. 
Thank you. People say Mr. Coulter I for some reason. <laughs> and only Phil understands. Coulter I. <laughs> and, okay. and thank you. Okay. Ready for the next one. Move that IFP 2000. Okay. Okay, yeah. Move that IFP 2020 dash six for pad mounted transformers be awarded to Wesco Distribution Inc. for two hundred and twenty thousand seven hundred and fifty six dollars pursuant to General Laws Chapter one sixty four, section fifty six D on the recommendation of General Manager. Second second motion. Okay. Okay, so Wesco was the lowest responsive proposal for all transformers. Two companies were non responsive. Uh, delivery is twelve to fourteen weeks and um, and I had listed the uh, price comparisons if you if you wanted to see them. D don't forget that when we put these things together, we actually put what, what you approved in the budget and in, in that these are below. So the budget for this item, for example, was 314000 and It came in at uh, 220 Mr. Cino-Eyes? Talbot-Eye. Walter-Eye. Thank you. That's right. motion care. All these are Next final. One. Move that IFP 2000, 2020-7 for one uh, Digger Derrick truck with trade-in be awarded to Minuteman Trucks, Inc. for $284,555.67 pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 164, Section 56D on the recommendation of the manager. Okay, so Minuteman was the second. lowest. You got a second on that? Second. Second. Okay, get a second. Minuteman was the lowest responsive proposer. All bids except one were responsive. Uh, delivery is 40 to 48 weeks. Um, and everybody knows what a digger is, right? Okay. Ms. Pacino, I? Ms. Tillery. Coulter, I? Mr. Stepback, I? Mr. Hesse, I? Okay. Move that IFP. 2020-10 for grounds and landscaping services be awarded to Pathfinder Tree Service LLC for $125,283 pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 30B as the lowest responsible, responsive and responsible bidder on the recommendation general manager. Okay. So uh, grounds and landscape services include spring and fall cleanup, weekly maintenance of lawns, bushes, trees, shrubs, as well as hardscape maintenance. Other services include clearing and maintaining brush and around fenced areas. Uh, landscaping is required on other properties in response to environmental issues, construction damage, or any vehicle incidents. Weekly maintenance is scheduled to perform for 27 weeks to eight properties. The properties consist of eight Ash Street Campus, Adopt an Island, three substations, one former substation in Linfield, and two right of ways. And it's for three years, right, if I recall? Correct. One of the six bids received, two were non responsive. Oh, um, I'm not reading your name, but. Okay. And this was like a little less than last time. I feel like this is the second or third time I've yeah. seen the landscaping contract. Is this lower than it was last time? Um, three year. Was it lower than last year? No, lower than the previous three year. 2017 was 110. 2020 was 125. So in hey, three, Ms. Pacino, I? In three years, it's no. gone up. Okay, Ms. Okay. Pacino, I? Okay, Ms. Talbot, I? Colter, I? Okay. That's it. Um, now, I think thought we had discussed putting the reorg on the agenda. Is it? It's the last item on the agenda. Yeah, we, we can do it now or we can do it at the beginning of the next meeting. I mean, okay. Um, How do the guys in the field phone about this? What's that? Yeah. It is okay, good. I just, I, for some reason it's not on mine. I don't know why. Unless I'm blind. What's that? Yeah, mine's a messy old version. Does anybody want to do this now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anybody? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So I, I think one of the things, Bob, a tradition here at RMLD is the peaceful transition of power. Okay. So that's a tradition that we like. So it means that, like the presidency, the board chair steps down every year, <laughs> unless there's a bitter fight over. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Does anybody have any nominations for? 
Second that nomination, Mr. Chair. Okay, and um, John is the is the vice chair now. And do we need a separate one for vice, or do we need? Is that all? How do we I'd do like that? To nominate uh, someone for vice chair. Actually. Okay. I'd like to nominate uh, the Hennessy vice chair. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So uh, we have a second on that. Second. Okay. I'll move to okay. close all nominations, Mr. Chair. Okay, I accept that motion. Uh, and does that mean we're ready for a vote? Yes. Okay. All in favor of the nominations that have been made? Yeah, I'm Mr. Bassino. I. Mr. Talbot, I. Coulter, I. Mr. Stepback, I. There we go. Mr. Hennessy, I. Okay, good. So I hereby, there you go. We were gavelous because it's a it's a vector. Mr. Chair, just, just as an added point, yep. um, I will I will assume the secretary position for all of next year. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, thank you. So. We don't have to rotate it. Uh, I'll be able to assume the second scroll. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so what else do we have to do here? General discussion. The next meeting is Thursday, April 16th. Are we good with that? I may be brain dead. Okay. Yeah. Assuming we're all still here. Um, and then Thursday the 21st. What? No. Positive. We're all yeah. going here. Well, the, the okay. back to back. Uh, oh, May 21st. Yeah, May 21st. Uh, yeah, and then, John, are you able to cover the April CAP meeting? You know, um, I can't do the 16th day from okay. the next board meeting, and uh, I know we might have a big vote there. Is there any chance we could do the following Thursday? I think, as far as I'm concerned, yes. Does anybody care? Let me, let me take a quick look at the... Okay, well, you know, um, you're going to run in potentially to town meeting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the 27th. Yeah, the Monday. Yeah, the Monday town meeting goes Monday and Thursday, so. Okay. I, I was wondering if the 16th may be town meeting also. You want to move it up to the uh, the 9th? No. No? No. Mm -hmm. You need to what? Yeah, right. Yeah, Well, could they not meet on the 9th? Then we can ask them, right? Yeah. Maybe we can look in. We'll figure it out offline, I guess, right? Talk to the cab and Can I make a comment before please. we go? So I was told that it's possible that I might be doing a taped presentation. Um, the financial auditors are not audit audited financials are not going to be done yet. Um, but usually I do uh, a presentation at the at the town meeting. I'm probably going to do taped and submit it as a taped. Okay. So um, that's what we're, I'm going to be working on. So I'm assuming that I'm probably not going to be invited for April 27th to, to be in person. So I'm just letting you know if you hear otherwise, please let me know. But that's what we're working on, Joyce and I. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's a discussion about whether town meeting is going to be open and then be closed. Okay. I can see what Alan, is, Alan Foles is talking about. Yeah. Um, you know. Are you in town meeting? Well, yes. Yeah. Assuming the pandemic is still going at that point, you know. Yeah. It would not be wise to meet yep. at all. So, Dave, if you want, you can leave it to the 16th of April, and then I'll just confirm. I'm not sure. I can't think that I can get back to you and Tracy and let you know. Okay. Leave it on the 16th. Okay. Can you, pretend, can you potentially be there remotely or no? I can get Okay. So, okay, got it. Okay, well, we'll figure it out offline. Um, and now we're ready to go into executive session, I think, right? Do we even have anything in executive session? Do we need... No, no, no executive session. I'll move to adjourn. Yes, okay, very good. Thank you very much. Mr. Pacino, I. Mr. Talbot, I. Coulter, I. Mr. Stepback, I. Well done. Mr. Hennessy, I. Welcome to Bob. Yes. Yeah. Bob, thank you for having me on board. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, everyone. And thank later. you very much. Stay healthy. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. When I can come in. Yeah. I'm so good riddance. Bob, you go through this because I know I am crazy right now. I can imagine that you are absolutely bonkers. So.